Um, th thank you very much for the, uh, the, the invitation to come here and speak. Um, so uh, let's hop straight into it. Um, maybe I should say a couple of words just before about this uh, institute uh, that I'm running at Oxford University, the Future of Humanity Institute. It's a grandiose uh, name for, for an institute, but we're about um, 12 or 14 um, people, mathematicians, philosophers, and scientists, and uh, our goal is to try to apply careful thinking to the really big picture questions for humanity. The questions that most people recognize as important, but that haven't traditionally um, been dealt with in academia, but have rather tended to be relegated to um, journalists, science fiction writers, maybe a retired physicist in his dotage writing a popular book. Um, but, but questions that, that are really important and that I think um, underpin a lot of our activities in the world, like a lot of the uh, efforts we are making uh, to try to move the world in a better direction implicitly relies on ideas and assumptions about what is feasible, what is possible, what is realistic in the long term and what is not. But, but those assumptions are often not made explicit, but by bringing them into the open, I think we can um, no, have, have, have a more constructive and intelligent um, deliberations about them. Um, so before, before I get to the future, let, let, let me first spend a few minutes kind of looking back into the deep past to, to get some context. Um, so this, this used to be where it was at uh, for most of the history of the human species, more than 95% of the time that Homo sapiens has been around, this was the condition in which we lived. Hunter-gatherer, small tribes on the African savanna, running around with spears. Um, and um, at this point, there was uh, relatively few of us, maybe a couple of million individuals or so. Um, there was very little by way of division of labor. Um, in many tribes, maybe women tended to spend more time raising children, and men tended to do more hunting, but basically people were jack of all trades. Um, and, and this is the natural condition for, 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 for humans, as, as insofar as we can determine one. And, uh, and so this is the, the condition to which our minds and bodies have adapted. We've spent a long time, many, many generations, and evolution kind of shaped us to, to thrive in this environment. You can see how, how, how ripped that guy there is, uh, a lot of exercise. But, but then, um, about 10,000 years ago, so something really profound happened, the agricultural revolution. And, and this is one of the most important things that have ever happened on, on this planet, to our species, where we learn to domesticate crops and animals. And this vastly increased uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the carrying capacity of a given plot of land. So now you could have much greater population densities. And more, more people could feed in a given area. And you could have uh, settlements, like you could remain in a particular place throughout the year, for many years, rather than having to roam around. And, and this had profound uh, effects on, on many different dimensions of the human condition. We begin to have stratified societies for the first time. When, when you have, when, when the food comes from berries you pick or, or, or game you hunt, you, you can't really uh, assemble a huge surplus to store. You have to really eat it uh, as you gather. But, but with grains, um, if, if you have uh, so, some, some troops, you can send them out and, and grab other people's grain and assemble them in a big silo. So now you begin to have stratified societies with tax collectors and, and administrations, and then you have a need for writing to keep track of who's paid what. Um, and, and although this is a kind of a big step forward in, in terms of world GDP, um, it, it's not necessarily a step forward in terms of the uh, individual welfare of, of, of the folk who were living here. You can see the nutritional status of, of the early farmers uh, tended to be worse, they had, like shorter stature, showed more nutritional deficiencies than their hunter-gatherer counterparts. Um, but what happens is that with a higher population densities, um, you get an increase in the speed of innovation. So there are more people around, more brains, having more ideas, and it's easier to communicate the ideas because people live closer together and you have writing. And, and you also begin to have division of labor, so people begin to specialize in a particular role. There are priests, there are tax collectors, there are farmers, there are soldiers. 
And if you spend your whole life doing one kind of thing, you tend to get better at that kind of thing. And so for all these reasons, we see a, a big uptick in, in the rate of, of discovery of new ideas. In, in, and you can see it in, in, if, if in, in the population uh, growth charts that it used to be a very, very slow increase in human population. But after the agricultural transition, uh, things start to happen at a more rapid clip. Um, you also got um, uh, slavery and such. Uh, but um, if we think about how these uh, folk view the future, it's, it's, it's interesting. They had obviously a lot of um, myths and religious conceptions, but in, in so far as um, people were thinking about the future here on Earth, the material conditions, um, it, it seems that for the most part they didn't envisage any change. So. Uh, Robert Heilbronner wrote this book about how, how the future has been viewed, and, and he noted that the, in this quote, at, at the very apex of the first stratified societies, dynastic dreams were dreamt and visions of triumph and ruin entertained, but there is no mention um, that people envisaged, even in the slightest degree, changes in the material conditions of the great masses, or for that matter, of the ruling class itself. So yes, you could imagine empires forming and falling, dynasties being overturned. But, but, but the basic idea that there is some directionality to history, some arrow of progress or development, te technologies become more and more advanced, that, that wasn't really present there. It was more a churn. Um, and that really only begins to change uh, with the second great transition in the history of humanity, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, at, at this point, around this time, it, I guess it starts getting obvious that things are not remaining constant. Like uh, things are changing at a rapid enough clip that even within an individual lifetime, you, you can perceive change. Like the, the level of technology when you were born and the level of technology when you retire is noticeably different. So it becomes hard to imagine the human condition as as as, as a permanent constant. So like it, it seems that there is some, and, and it seems to have some directionality. It's not just that things randomly change; it's there is some kind of accumulation economic, technological, scientific. So with the Industrial Revolution, you, you get another huge increase um, in the rate of growth. Populations had been growing faster since the Agricultural Revolution than they did when we were hunter-gatherers, but with industrialization, they begin to grow much faster still. And the nature of work changes, so you now have um, a lot of people um, moving into to, uh, perform work in, in factories, you, you get the kind of um, proletariat of, of you, you get regimentation of work routines. It's very important if you have a big factory that everybody turns up on time. You can't just straggle in whenever you feel like it. You need to have clocks and bells and whistles and systems for managing the production. Uh, you need capital investments. So there are a lot of changes that, that go together with this that also affect kind of the experience of, of being a human being and a worker. Um, and, and something else starts to happen. So up until this point, and, and still in the early stages of uh, the Industrial Revolution, we basically, along with all other animals, inhabited a, a broadly Malthusian condition. Sometimes um, we learn how to make more with less technological progress, but population growth. So like the, the more food you can produce, the, the more children survive, so the more mouths there are to feed. And, and that, that you know, yeah, as, as a first approximation, is, is the condition of, of, of all creatures in nature. There are exceptions to this. If, if there is some big calamity, say a plague ravages a country, or some giant earthquake kills off a lot of people, then for a period of time there is a surplus. After, you know, immediately in the aftermath there is more land than is needed and people can enjoy it in abundance. Uh, so that's one way in which you can temporarily escape the Malthusian condition. Another is uh, if you have uh, social inequality, like with, uh, you have after the agricultural revolution, there, there can be some strata that can expropriate resources from other elements of society and, and enjoy above subsistence level incomes. Um, but, uh, but only in exceptional circumstances. But after the industrial revolution, what you get is economic growth so fast that although population is also growing very rapidly, it can't grow as quickly as the economy. So this results in average income beginning to increase. That can only happen if, if the economy grows faster than population. And, and this, 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 uh, this system brings us to the normal human condition. Um, 
which is where we are now. And so it's always peculiar to me when I'm, I'm so, so we are often thinking about where, where, where things might lead in the longer term, but a lot of people think that there's this extraordinary burden of proof if one wants to take seriously scenarios in which things could change radically, and as, as if this is kind of the baseline, and then a claim that things could be very different from this is some extraordinary hypothesis that, that is hard to credit. But, but even just looking at this historical context, I think, highlights just how, how bizarre and absurd this is. This is like the, the idea that this will continue for thousands of years, or, or even longer. That, that seems to me the extraordinary hypothesis. Um, and so another way of um, bringing home the same point is if we just plot world GDP over the past 10,000 years, you can see it kind of creeping along there, um, creeping along the, uh, the x-axis, and then shooting up just recently. Um, so it, it's hard just sort of eyeballing this to think that right now we're in a normal stationary uh, epoch of this. It, it, it really looks like an enormous anomaly. Um, the, the, the reason you not, not normally see this kind of graph is that usually people plot the y-axis on the log scale just to bring out more structure. But if you really just want to see how, how unusual the current condition is, I think you should just have a linear scale and, and then you basically see nothing until you see a spike. So, if we're asking what, what the reason is for, for, for the current anomaly and, and for these developments that we've seen, um, you might say it's technology, technological development. Uh, and, and that's true, that technology is the proximate cause, um, but, but underlying that, there's more ultimate cause, which is uh, human brains. So it's through some relatively slight changes in, in the lineage that led to more modern homo sapiens um, that, that, that gave us this uh, greater ability to uh, in, invent technologies and to would give us the ability to learn language so that we can share insights. So you can have cultures that accumulate from generation to generation and build upon what our predecessors knew. Uh, so some, some relatively um, modest changes in, in the neural architecture, this is what you find under the hood, it's more or less the same thing. One is slightly larger, um, and also some differences in the exact way in which it is wired. But these different mechanisms that might operate in our mind, they can't be too complicated because there have only been a relatively small number of uh, generations of natural selection since our last common ancestor with, with the, uh, the great apes. And, and we know that complicated mechanisms take a very long time to evolve. So some relatively minor tweaks in the exact algorithmic structure plus some scaling results in our current intellectual capabilities, and that in turn results in all our technology, all our population growth, um, all, all, all this, this, this abundance and, and abnormality that, that is now the modern human condition. It, it, it then leads one immediately uh, to think about um, how this factor that has shaped everything else, how, how that factor might change in the future. Uh, in, in particular, what would happen if and when uh, there are further increases to human intelligence uh, or some other intelligence that surpasses human. There are basically two possible paths to superintelligence. You can imagine increases in biological intelligence, such as over evolutionary timescales we have seen. Um, or you could imagine artificial intelligence. Right now, computers um, are far inferior to us in terms of general intelligence, general purpose smartness and learning ability, but uh, improving at a more rapid clip. So it, 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 it's an open question which of these will get there first, which will first get to superintelligence, but there are two independent avenues, either of which could, uh, in principle, bring us to superintelligence. Uh, and, and as I shall argue shortly, I think that that it would be um, a watershed moment, not just one more cool technology, another iPhone or another nifty little gadget, but a, a fundamental game changer. As important, or rather, I think, more important than the Industrial Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution. Um, let, let's just look in a little bit more detail first as to how one, how one might imagine that this could happen. So we could distinguish in terms of increases to biological intelligence, on the one hand, biomedical interventions, sort of smart drugs or genetic stuff, uh, 
also networks and organizations, improvements in the way that we function as epistemic aggregates. So, so there are collectives of humans that can solve problems that no individual humans can solve. The scientific community can do things that no individual scientists can do. So another way to you know, achieve some form of superintelligence would be by having huge improvements in, in information technology or epistemic institutions or other ways in which we can like, bring our individual intelligence together. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say very much about that uh, today, but I think that is an important category. Uh, I'll, I'll return shortly to machine intelligence. Then, then in between, we also could imagine some kind of hybrid approach, the, um, the, the cyborg path where you would kind of, the, the idea being you would like combine the best of, of biology and machine. Now, I'm skeptical that that, I don't think that that's where the action will be. I think it's just very technically difficult to significantly enhance uh, human intellectual capabilities by implanting things in the body in, in ways that you couldn't get by just having the same devices outside of yourself. So wouldn't it be cool if you could just access Google by thinking about it? Well, maybe, but you know, I can have a smartphone and access Google. Yet. I don't have to check into the newer surgery every time a new version comes out. Um, so I think that brain computer interfaces yeah, for, for various people with disabilities, I think they're great medical applications, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think that that's how we will get to super intelligence. Um, so maybe I'll just say a few words first about this, um, the biological, um, because this is um, the, the place where I think that that will first become technologically feasible is in uh, embryo sele selection. Um, genetic engineering of embryos or genetic selection of embryos. So this is, I think, uh, fairly close at hand, as in maybe 10 years or so. And it, uh, all, all that is missing currently from being able to do this uh, is information, no, no new technology or gadget or instrumentation. Um, just better understanding of the genetic architecture of, of human intelligence. And uh, so, so we know that uh, the, the variation in human intelligence has, like there's an environmental component and, and a heritable component. We've discovered that the heritable component is not due to uh, three or four or five different genes that some people have and some not. Instead, there's a huge number of genes, hundreds, maybe in the low thousands, that each have a very, very small effect on, on your cognitive abilities. So to identify these very, very small effects, you need very, very large sample sizes. You need to sequence the genomes of large numbers of people, hundreds of thousands, maybe in the low millions, to, to detect these small uh, influences. And, and that has been impracticable, but is now becoming feasible thanks to the falling price of gene sequencing. So uh, as we're speaking, there are these uh, genome, whole genome studies uh, with um, sample sizes of hundreds of, low hundreds of thousands. And that might be enough to begin to detect some, some part of this heritable uh, variance in intelligence, but, but with larger such studies in the years to come, in the millions, I think a substantial fraction of the heritability will be um, uh, deciphered. And, and after you have that, then you really need nothing else. So the way that this would presumably first be used is in the context of in vitro fertilization. They have um, um, some fertility procedure that results in maybe eight or 10 embryos that's done routinely in fertility clinics today, and then the doctor selects one of these and implants. Now, today, the doctor will kind of visually inspect to see if it looks normal, the embryo. And, and maybe you can, you can, you can screen for, for a certain monogenic uh, disorders, chromosomal abnormalities, and, and then the doctor will select like a healthy looking embryo and implant that. You, you can't currently select for some complex behavioral trait. Uh, but, but once this information is, is available, then you could do that if you decided to do that. Um, it's possible to estimate roughly the uh, effect sizes of, of different strengths of selection. So if you take two random embryos and select the one that has the highest disposition, genetic disposition for intelligence, you would expect to gain, um, on average, about four IQ points, which is very little, um, barely, barely noticeable. If you instead select, you have a pool of 10 embryos and you select the most promising one of those, you'd get, say, 11. IQ points, and, and, and you can see here that you face steeply diminishing returns. So selecting 
one in a thousand might give you a standard deviation and a half. Um, but that's really infeasible with, with um, in vitro fertilization, you really might have one or maybe two fertility cycles. So you, it, it's really impractical to go above maybe 20 embryos or so on. So there's a kind of significant effect you could gain from this, but, but still limited. There, there is, however, a, a complementary technology that doesn't yet exist, but which would greatly increase the effect size you could gain from, um, from embryo selection. And, and this, this is the technology of producing gametes from embryonic stem cells. So the idea is that you would have an embryo, take a stem cell from that embryo, and use that to produce new egg and sperm cell that you could recombine to produce a new set of embryos. And then you could select one embryo from that set, and you could repeat the procedure. So with this technology, you would be able to compress the human generation span from 20 or 30 years down to uh, weeks, or maybe a month or so. And, and instead of having like as in the old school uh, eugenics, tried to persuade populations to change their breeding patterns over many generations, you would just have a petri dish that somebody would puck around in. Um, so, so with this, you, you get a very different regime. So here, you can compare, for example, 10 generations of selecting one in 10 in each generation. So that involves a total of 100 embryos. But instead of getting say, 19 IQ points, as you would with a one-shot selection from a pool of 100 embryos. With this, you would get, um, it looks, a genome with a higher disposition to uh, intelligence than any that has existed in, in all of human history. So, already with this technology, it looks like you would get at least some sort of weak forms of superintelligence. Now, now this, this, this technology doesn't yet exist for use in humans, but it, but it, has, it has been used in, uh, in mice, uh, gametes have been derived from embryonic stem cells and used to produce new fertile mice. So it's not like complete science fiction technology, but, but it, there is some uncertainty as to how long it will take to, to, to achieve the high reliability and safety that would be needed for, for human application, uh, initially presumably to treat uh, fertility disorders. And, and then once this technology is available, then of course there, there are like um, uh, myriad ethical issues and you might imagine maybe different cultures and different countries will have different rules and attitudes as to whether or not they use this. Um, but from a purely technological feasibility point of view, it looks like the, the limited selection may be feasible in the next five or 10 years. And, and this uh, iterated embryo selection, there's more uncertainty on that, 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 might, take, um, that might take longer. Um, uh, depending on your willingness to accept risk and stuff. Um, so, so, so much for the biological path. Now, uh, let's briefly look at the machine intelligence path towards superintelligence. So, you probably come across various of these classical milestones. Every once in a while, AI achieves some spectacular task that kind of reaches the, 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 the public media and, and makes a little splash for the, the defeat of Gary Kasparov by the chess computer Deep Blue. Uh, some, some of you might remember that, and uh, that, that at the time that, that was kind of uh, looked as a big deal. Before this happened, before chess computers became that good, many people thought of chess as like really chess playing, like the epitome of human intellection, right? deep strategy, thinking, logic. Um, it seemed like a, a very advanced intellectual task. A after after computers succeeded in that, it, we've kind of maybe uh, downgraded uh, that in, in our esteem hierarchy. So now, now we think, well, you know, chess is just kind of mechanical calculation. And, and, and it's not completely facetious. To some extent, it, it turns out that there are two different ways of being good at chess. So either the hu you can do it the human way, which does indeed require uh, like sophisticated pattern recognition, planning, strategizing, or you can do it in the way that computers do, which requires none of that, but it requires uh, a, a lot of computational power and more brute force exploration of the circuitry. And, and it turns out that if you have enough computing power and some clever uh, tricks, you can, you can actually play chess at a very high level, in, indeed at a higher level than humans can. Um, um, then we have, we've got the self-driving cars and stuff that uh, advances in, in mobile robotics. Um, the um, uh, the game show Jeopardy, uh, where the uh, IBM system Watson defeated, this was like, I guess, a few years ago now, 
uh, defeated the all-time human champions in this trivia quiz show. Um, and, um, and more recently advances in, in deep learning, which is, uh, so, so AI used to be like in, in, in the 60s, and, and maybe this is a way perhaps that a lot of people think about it. It used to be about basically putting commands in a box. So you would have programmers that would sort of hand code knowledge items uh, and put them into an expert system, and, and then the system could perform some simple logical derivation. And the problem there was these systems didn't really scale. They, they were very brittle. Like you put in one erroneous assumption and the whole thing just spewed out nonsense. Um, and so, so, so that, that is kind of a cul-de-sac. But today, AI is much more about machine learning. Um, and so with these deep learning algorithms, you basically feed the system a lot of raw information, perceptual input, and then the system learns by uh, processing this information to extract interesting feature, higher order representation, to detect patterns, much in the way that, 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 that we do when, when we are thrust into this world. We learn to recognize the world, not, not by having somebody kind of provide a list of, of propositional tokens, but, but by interpreting and detecting patterns and building up representation from raw perceptual data. So in, in, in deep learning, that it's like a neural network that has some multiple layers. And these pictures you see here, this like, um, uh, you had this, uh, this deep neural network that was trained on, on pictures uh, found on the internet, typical internet pictures. And what happens is that in the lower uh, layers of this network, you get simple um, visual elements like neurons that specialize in detecting uh, uh, contours of objects. Uh, edges, corners, and then in uh, sort of the deeper uh, levels of the network, you get more abstract, complex features. For example, uh, kind of archetypal face recognition neurons or cat recognition neurons in this case. Um, and, um, and in the last couple of years, there has been kind of a, a good deal of excitement about things that where it looked like we were previously stuck, where, where, where things now are coming loose and are beginning to move again. With, significant advances in, in automatic translation, uh, in image segmentation, uh, image recognition, image uh, parsing, uh, describing, like putting captions to images. Um, the, the way it used to be, so you might have used Google Images, and you know that's been available for quite a long time, but the way that that used to be done was that you had a picture on some web page, and then usually there would be some text around it, and Google would just kind of call it the text that somebody had written around the picture, and then if you search for that text, you would find the picture. But with these neural methods, uh, the, the, the software is actually looking at the picture itself and recognizing if it, if it looks like a cat or if it looks like children playing or a car driving. Um, and, and even more recently, uh, this was just earlier this year, the, uh, the, the DeepMind company in London uh, um, developed um, an AI that can learn to play uh, Atari computer games out of the box, but from raw perceptual input, so it's just given the pixels on the screen and nothing else. Um, and the same AI learns, like after playing these for a few hours, to, to, to play any of these different Atari games, the same algorithm for all these different Atari games, so some of them at the superhuman level. So the interesting thing here is not how you can play Atari games, but the interesting thing is that this is fairly powerful general purpose learning algorithm, that, that you don't have to sort of pre-program uh, on task by task, but that has this, this, this kind of ability to, to take any raw perceptual input and recognizing data and structure in that. So, um, so, so these various milestones and other applications have been made feasible through a number of underlying uh, algorithmic improvements that, and remember this, this whole field is really only 70 years old, we've only had computers for 70 years or so, right? So, um, so all, all, all that has happened is, is, is on historical time scale quite recent. Um, it looks like some additional number of breakthrough ideas, concepts like these will be needed to get all the way to human level intelligence. We don't know how many, whether it's kind of two more of these that are missing or whether it's like 50. Um, also improvements in hardware have played a role. So if we look, for instance, at chess computing, about half of the performance gains that we have seen there have been due to computers just being faster. And, and the other half have been due to uh, software improvements. Uh, and that 
the, the exact proportions differ, but, but as a rule of thumb, roughly half of the advancement in AI has come from ha hardware and half from some better algorithms. So, so we now have AI um, running <laughs> in a lot of applications throughout the economy. Um, there's some small sample here. Like AI researchers sometimes complain that as soon as something actually works, it's no longer called AI. We just think of it as software. But, but a lot of these techniques were developed initially in the AI community and has since found applications. So it's not as if the field has achieved nothing. It's just that the bar is kind of gradually moved. Um, and, 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 and in the last couple of years, there's been this uh, like renewed uh, hype bubble or excitement wave um, with a number of uh, acquisitions and, and currently a kind of scavenge hunt for talent and people are trying to scoop up promising AI researchers. Uh, but if we look back at the history of AI, there have been two previous periods when there were great hopes and then they were followed by periods of disillusionment, what's known in the literature as AI winters, when, when it became passe, like nobody wanted to call their startup company an AI company, they would pretend it was something different. Um, um, but each of these two previous AI winters have been followed by a kind of thaw up and, and now we're in like the third wave of excitement. And it's anybody's guess whether this will be the wave that carries all the way through uh, to, to, to success or, or whether there will be additional um, AI winters troughs, disappointments before we finally get there. Um, so so w one, one kind of domain where it's easy to compare uh, machines to, to humans because there are clear rules uh, like game AI where we can see that humans have been uh, uh, defeated um, I think the next one to go will be uh, the game Go, which is kind of what, what chess is to the Western world. Go is to the Eastern world, like Asia. Go is this huge board game, with, um, uh, wh which is just ha it's harder for computers to, to do well on it than, than it has the higher branching factors. Like at each, each, each point in play, there are more different moves you can make, so it's harder to do apply brute force methods there. But, but I think that uh, possibly later this year we will see some um, some, some radical advance there. So, um, a, a, a question that arises then is like, just how far away are we from uh, having machines that match humans? Not just in specific domains, but that have the same general purpose, uh, learning and planning ability, the same general intelligence that we have. Um, we did a survey uh, a couple of years ago uh, where we asked, um, some of the world's leading AI experts, what they thought uh, the answer to this question was. One, one specifically we asked, by what year do you think there's a 50% probability that we will have achieved human level artificial intelligence? Uh, which we define here as the ability to perform virtually any job um, as well as a human adult. So genuine human level intelligence, not just kind of domain specific. And the, the, the median answer to that was 2050 or 2040, depending on precisely which group of experts we ask. Um, but but we, we, with a lot of spread on, on, on both sides of the, it could happen much sooner or it could take much longer. Um, it's, uh, it, it's important to distinguish this question um, from a, another question. So, so, so the, the question I, I just showed some answer to is the question of how wide this interval is here. Like how, how, how far are we from, from the point where we have some form of human equivalent? But a, another question, which is also important, is if and when that moment occurs, how, how long will it be from that point until we have something that is radically super intelligent? Um, my own view is that I'm fairly agnostic on the first question. I, it's just very hard to, to predict these things. Um, you know, so some number of decades, maybe longer, uh, until we're likely to have human equivalents. But I think that if and when that, that level is reached, I think we will, uh, with fairly high probability, soon thereafter have super intelligence. I think it might take a lot longer to get to human level than from human level to super intelligence. Um, and you know, in, in the Q&A, we can talk more about, about that if we want to. Um, but I, I want to move on to sort of the third chapter of, of this, this presentation. So um, if, if we look, zoom out and, and look at the human condition from a very abstract and schematic uh, perspective, 
we can think of it as in this diagram here, where we have on one axis some intuitive notion of capability, like level of technological advancement, some total of our pro economic productive capabilities, and time at the other axis. And so here, the human condition, um, demarcated by these dotted lines in the middle there, uh, represents a narrow band of all possible levels of capability that, that the species or civilization could have. It, it's bounded at the lower end by this short-term viability threshold. So in population biology, there is the concept of a minimum viable population size. Like if you have too few individuals left of a species, it goes extinct. You, know, you don't have enough to preserve their genetic diversity and such. Um, so similarly, there needs to be some minimum level of, of productive capability, food production, etc., for, for humanity to survive at all. If we have less than that, then uh, we enter this attractor state here, extinction. And the thing with extinction is that once you reach that state, uh, you tend to stay there. Once you are extinct, you tend to stay extinct. So that's like a permanent place we could end up. Um, but I think that there's this other uh, attractor state in this picture, another condition such that if you reached it, you might remain in that condition for a very long time, billions of years. And uh, that there is a corresponding demarcation to the human condition such that if you kind of exit above that, then you might be very likely to end up in this ultimate attractor state. And that's, the, that's, that's basically the line when you have developed technological maturity, all those technologies that we can currently see are physically possible, including machine superintelligence and all the other technologies that might follow very quickly if you have like super intelligent technologists and scientists doing the inventing at digital timescales. And you have this civilization that has begun to, to spread through space, colonize the galaxy and so forth. From that point onward, it might just be a lot harder to imagine things that could cause its extinction. And it might just be pretty much foreordained at that point. If we reach that point, that will just continue to expand um, indefinitely um, for billions of years so until we have like, colonized all the accessible matter in the universe. Like at some point, there's like a finite bubble around us of, of matter that we could in principle access even if we traveled by the speed of light because of the expansion of the universe. But things that are too far away, we can never reach. They're gliding uh, away from us faster than we could move towards them. But so there's this huge Hubble volume that of, 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 of maybe uh, 10 to the power of 22 stars or so. That is our cosmic endowment. And uh, the other attractive state there is that we will embark up on a trajectory that will result in all of this eventually being reached. Um, so um, another point that this, this schematic tries to make is that the human condition is, is a narrow band and maybe we could bounce around there for a little while. Maybe that could be a big, no, maybe a nuclear war, a catastrophe, and then after a few hundred years, maybe we are back and you could imagine. But, but uh, the longer the time scale are considering, the greater the probability that we will exit the human condition in, in either of these two directions and then end up in an attractive state. Um, so if we now want to think about this from an ethical point of view, um, I, I want to bring in a, a thought experiment actually by a fellow um, Oxfordian philosopher, Derek Parfit. And the, he wrote this book back in, when was it, 86, I think, where he had a famous thought experiment where he asked us to cons consider three uh, possible scenarios. So one is there's peace. Uh, another scenario is that there is a nuclear war that kills 99% of the world's existing population. And uh, a third scenario is that there's a nuclear war that kills everybody. Um, so, so the order of preference here is, is, is obvious. Like we would prefer A, right? That's the best. If we had to choose between A and B, uh, B and C, then well, we prefer B over C. So most people would think that that's kind of intuitive. Um, but the interesting thing here is if we look at the difference between these, not, not just the, uh, the, the, the order, but how big the difference is between these, between these different three scenarios. So if we look at the number of people killed, right, so the difference between C and B in the number of people killed is around 70 million. Okay, so one, one percent difference, right? The world population is 70 billion, uh, 7 billion, so one percent of that is 70 million. Um, so that's a lot less than the difference between A and B. The difference between A and B is 7 billion minus 70. Uh, 
George said, right? So that's a much larger difference. So if, if all you care about is the number of people died, then you would think that the difference between a B and A is much larger than the difference between C and B. However, this is the point that Parfait made, is that if we, instead of asking how many people would be killed, and the difference is in that, if we instead ask about how bad these scenarios would be, then he argued that the difference in badness between B and C is vastly greater than the difference in badness between B and A. Because the difference between C and B is not just that an extra 70 million people die, it's that the entire future is destroyed as well. And there might be thousands, there might be millions, there might be billions of generations that could come to exist eventually if we achieve like a sustainable future. And, and that, that value that is on the line there is much larger than even the value of all lives that are currently being lived on this planet. Um, we, we can put some numbers on this, not very precise numbers, but just to get some sense of the enormous magnitudes online. Um, let's first consider just our own planet, planet Earth, and it will remain habitable uh, perhaps for another billion years or so until the sun expands and it becomes too hot. So imagine if we could achieve a sustainable state in which maybe a billion people could live on this planet not for, for a billion years. That would be um, 10 to the power of 16 human lives of each 100 years. Um, so if we now compute the expected value of reducing existential risk by mere one millionth of one percentage point. So the expectation value is simply when you multiply the, uh, the a value with the probability of achieving it. It's like standard decision theory. Um, then you find that the expected value of reducing existential risk by mere one millionth of one percentage point, like a tiny little reduction, just to make the world a teeny, teeny little bit safer from existential risk, then that's worth at least a hundred times the value of uh, a million human lives. So imagine if you could save a million human lives, like cure some horrible uh, disease or, or you intervene to stop a famine or like stop a new Hitler from, you know, that, like an enormous amount of good. No, like couldn't hope of achieving that much good in, 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 in in your life, even if you spend all your days like this. But, but according to this reasoning, it looks like from this simple-minded utilitarian calculation, it would be much better to reduce the amount of existential risk by one millionth of one percentage point uh, than to save a whole million of lives. Um, and, and so that's only considering the lives that could exist here on the planet Earth. Like if we more realistically take into account some probability of, of our descendants eventually you know, colonizing the universe, and and you make some assumptions about the technology they could have, then, then you get a far larger number, which would uh, not change the computation, it would just make it even more extreme. Makes it even more extreme. So from this, from this perspective, if, if you were a utilitarian, it looks like um, um, the, the goal of reduce, reducing existential risk, the, the existential risk here is like a pan-generational um, risk of crushing severity. Uh, either human extinction or something that could permanently lock our, us into some radical suboptimal state. Um, if you're a utilitarian, it looks like your practical decision making could be simplified to, to this Maxipok rule. Maximize the probability of an okay outcome, or an okay outcome is any that avoids existential catastrophe. So, for, at least for this particular ethical theory, uh, we have made some progress in simplifying what it actually amounts to in practice. Like often it's very complicated to see how some long-term goal could best be realized in the world with the uh, possibility of unanticipated side effects and so forth. And this doesn't go all the way to telling exactly what you should do concretely, but it does simplify the problem. If you're a utilitarian, um, your, your decision problem simplifies to the problem of figuring out how best to reduce existential risk. And, and most causes are just not good candidates for the best way to reduce existential risk. It narrows it down. Um, if you're not a utilitarian, but maybe you still place at least some weight on uh, the, the welfare of future generations, then you know, this should be a component in your decision making, even if you recognize maybe other ethical considerations in addition. So maybe you recognize you have special obligations to your family and friends, deontological restrictions, not to lie, steal, or murder, but, but uh, you also care to some extent about the welfare of, of uh, sentient life, then, then this should kind of flow in. And maybe to the extent that you're driven by these considerations, you should focus that 
in the maximally existential risk reducing uh, direction. So this way of looking at it is not reflected in current academic priorities. We did a little li literature survey. We counted the number of uh, scientific papers on some different topics here. So you can see there's a lot of interest in the dung beetle. Um, academics are also busy studying snowboarding and zinc oxalate. The human extinction, not, not, not so much. Um, <laughs> So let's move relatively quickly through the next. So there's this little sort of mini subfield that now I've, we've been trying to, to, to change this kind of disproportionate allocation of resources by focusing and trying to encourage other people to, um, to focus more on, on the really important stuff. And so like just this year, we're actually starting a kind of sister institute at Cambridge University, the Center for the Study of Existential Risks. So that, that like is, you know, slow moving, but still, there's some, some, some recent indications that, 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 that there is, especially among young people going into these fields, increased interest in these things. So, but, but so like, I just, I'm, I'm not gonna go into like the details of different existential risks and how to compare them, but that's a, at a very sort of bird's eye overview level, you, you could distinguish risks from nature versus risks that arise in some way from human activity. And um, it, it one, one, one sort of early finding is that all the big existential risks, at least if we're thinking about the time scale of 100 years or so, are anthropogenic. So, so yes, there are existential risks from nature, from asteroids and supervolcanoes and so forth, but, but they are very, very small. And moreover, they are known to be very, very small. And one like, quick way to maybe convince ourselves that that is so is that just by reflecting, the human species has been around already for more than 100,000 years. So if all these things haven't done us in in 100,000 years, they're probably not gonna kill us in the next 100 years. Whereas we will, in this century, be introducing entirely new kinds of phenomena and dangers through um, our technological ingenuity that we have no track record of surviving. So if there's gonna be a big risk, it's probably gonna be from this new novel category rather than from, from, from the earthquake category or, or firestorms or volcano eruptions. Um, that, that, that conclusion is, is, is reinforced if you then look in more detail at the specific risk categories. You can study asteroid threat and the impact distributions and look through telescopes and it, it basically confirms this. Um, so an, another way of making kind of this same point but, but with a different framing is to think of um, the human history metaphorically as the process of extracting balls from a giant urn. And here the balls represent discoveries, technologies, ideas. That, that human beings come across. So we reach into this and we pull up another ball. Oh, the plow. Okay, and then we uh, pull out another gunpowder. Another, like, uh, you know, electricity. And um, so far, we've pulled out a great many balls from this earth, and, and on balance, they have been enormously beneficial. I mean, they, they are basically the reason why we are now in this modern human condition rather than in the Malthusian condition. Uh, that, that characterized most of human history. Um, so most balls have been like beneficial, like represented by color white here. Some, some have been more mixed blessings, um, like sort of nu nuclear energy and uh, like guns, you know. Some, some might even have been a, a darker shade of, of gray there, like maybe technologies we would have been better off without. Um, it's actually non-trivial to think of a really good example of that. But, but you can think like some torture devices or poison gases or you know, a few other. Uh, what, what we haven't yet done is to extract the black ball, like some hypothetical technology or idea that invariably spells uh, the destruction of the civilization that discovers it. What could such a thing be? Well, I mean, uh, think back to the, um, the discovery of uh, nuclear energy, like when we developed uh, the nuclear bomb, not, not very far from here, in Los Alamos, then, um, well, it, so it turns out that yes, a nuclear bomb is quite destructive locally, but it's also very hard to make. You need these difficult to obtain raw materials. You need highly enriched uranium or plutonium, both, both of which are hard, require big facilities, like a lot of energy, a lot of skilled scientists. It, it's just hard, but suppose it had turned out instead that you could have created a nuclear bomb through some simple method, like maybe by baking sand in the microwave oven or something like that, right? Okay, so now, now we know that that's physically impossible. You can't 
create the nuclear detonation by baking sand. Uh, but before we did the relevant physics, before people did uh, quantum physics and particle physics, how could we have known how it would turn out? Right? It just, we were lucky. It turned out that there is a way to release this energy, but only a very difficult way. If it had been the case that had been an easy method, then maybe that would have been the black ball. That could have been the end of human civilization. Because once anybody in their garage could uh, like have the ability to destroy a city, maybe you could no longer have cities, and maybe that would be the end of human civilization. Because in any population of a few million individuals, there's always going to be some who, who is either insane or crazy or hateful or spiteful or wants to blackmail or like so. If, 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 if any individual could kill bil millions of people, then it might just be impossible to have. Okay. So, so, so far we've been just lucky that there hasn't been a black hole, but it, it looks like um, if, if there were a black hole, then we will eventually extract it. And while we have a great ability to pull balls out of the urn, we don't have the ability to put balls back into the urn. We don't currently have the ability to uninvent inventions. Um, so it, it looks like we just have to hope that there is no black ball in there. And that, that's another way of kind of I, I think pointing to the category of risk that I think is the big one. And, and this says here are some possible technologies that might pose some existential risks in, in, in addition to having enormous beneficial applications, of course. Um, and um, you notice there at the bottom I put several unknowns because we should be relatively modest, but if, if, if somebody had asked 100 years ago what are the biggest existential risks over the next 100 years, like, um, they, they certainly wouldn't have mentioned artificial intelligence. I mean, they didn't even have computers, so nobody would have thought of that as a risk. Nor synthetic biology, it wasn't a concept, nor molecular nanotechnology. You know, possibly some people would have worried some about totalitarianism, um, for the most part, though, all, all the, the risks that we might currently think are the really big ones going forward were not even on the radar 100 years ago. So we should like, allow for the possibility that there might be additional big risks that haven't yet entered our radar, but that might be discovered in the coming decade. And uh, that, that suggests also that there might be a high value to doing research and analysis on this topic in case we could um, discover some existential risk that is big and that we could actually do something about then by conjunction with this earlier maxi particle then that, that, that activity itself might be extremely valuable which is in fact the, um, w one of the reasons why uh, I'm, I'm working in this field and, and some of my colleagues that it just looks like there's a very high value of information in, in some of these areas. Um, so let me just round out, and so like in terms of what we could possibly do about this, I actually think that I'm kind of sympathetic to um, a sort of m mild form of technological determinism. Um, obviously, the particular details um, about how and where technologies are developed and in what circumstances depends on individual human action. Um, I think, though, that it might be the case that the broad patterns are a kind of four So I, I have the metaphor here. Like, imagine a big box that starts out empty, and, and then you pour a bit of sand into the box. So this corresponds to a big space of possible technologies or discoveries, and, and where you pour the sand represents which technological directions you prioritize. Like, wh where, where do you give your research funding? Do you give it to clean energy, or do you, do you give it to cancer research? So depending on which research you fund, like where, where you pour the sand, you will get a different pile building up somewhere in the box. Uh, but if you just keep pouring, like eventually the whole box fills up, independently of exactly where you pour. So I think technology is a little bit like that. Yes, you might get faster, you advance in one area if you, if you concentrate the funding there, but eventually like there are spillovers, there are things that become more and more obvious uh, with a sufficiently high level of, of general scientific understanding and then the box fills up. So. Um, I, I think it's fairly possible that this technological completion conjecture is true, which says that if scientific and technological development efforts do not effectively cease, then all the important basic capabilities that could be obtained through some possible technology will be obtained. Um, so so, so how, how to think about this then? If, if, if it is the case that, uh, that it looks like all the big existential risks will arise from certain future technological discoveries, and yet we are kind of bound to eventually make those discoveries uh, unless we permanently ruin our civilization, which would itself be an existential catastrophe. What, what should our attitude be to, to this whole enterprise? 
And um, one, one answer is, 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 um, is, is that uh, I find best expressed by this, some, some random commenter on some internet blog, Washbash. So he said, I instinctively think go faster, not because I think it's better for the world. Why should I care about the world when I'm dead and gone? I want it to go fast, damn it. This increases the chance I have of experiencing a more technologically advanced future. So this is one answer. Uh, is this a good answer? Well, we have to be clear about exactly what the question is. Right? Okay, so if the question is, what would be best for me or for us, like selfishly, then I think uh, from a selfish point of view, we probably have reason to hope that technology will move very rapidly. Uh, maybe there are some existential risks that we might have to be confronted anyway, but um, you know, for individuals, like the, the overwhelming risk is that, that we just die from natural causes like aging is kind of slowly rotting us away from the inside. A few decades from now, we'll all be eaten by worms, you know, this is the only possible way that there could be any chance of escaping that, you know, would be some radical technological breakthrough, super intelligence, uploading into computers, cure for aging, like some, some radical shakeup is the only, or even failing that, at least we could live out our remaining decades, you know, with a slightly, you know, more interesting gadgetry and, and higher quality of life. So. If, if the question is what is best for me personally, then I think Washpash answer is, is, is actually correct. However, if we ask a different question, not what would be best for us personally, but what would be best impersonally, what would cause the most good, then I think a different answer is more possible, something perhaps um, um, related to what I call the principle of differential technological development, which says that we should retard the development of dangerous and harmful technologies, especially ones that raise the level of existential risk, and accelerate the development of beneficial technologies, especially those that reduce the existential risks posed by nature or other technologies. So the idea here is that maybe all these technologies will eventually be discovered if, if we avoid existential catastrophe. However, we might make some difference on the margin as to exactly when and how a particular technology is developed. Maybe by working really hard and investing a lot of money, we can make a technology become available uh, two months earlier than, than it otherwise would. And, uh, or, or maybe by, by ceasing to uh, promote the technology, maybe we could delay it by a few weeks. And, and it's these small differences on the margin that I think we should be concerned with. And they might affect, in particular, the sequence in which key technologies are developed. And, and, and in some cases, the sequence in which they are developed might make a big difference to the integral of existential risk encountered on the trajectory. For example, with relation to artificial intelligence, if there is a technology uh, to make machines intelligent, and, and there is another possible technology to make intelligent machines safe, we would want the safety technology to be developed before uh, the intelligence technology. And, and both of these are interesting technologies, but maybe we could like push a little differentially on the safety technology to increase the chances that we get at first. You know, with biotechnology, you could apply a similar thing, like if there's gonna be a designer pathogen that like, has very high lethality and long incubation time, but there's also gonna be at some point like a universal vaccine or a really good diagnostic, you want like, to push preferentially on the diagnostic and the vaccine, hoping we get that before the really dangerous stuff to cure harm. And so in, in general, rather than asking for a particular technology, is this technology good or bad? Would it be desirable to have nanotechnology or not? Do we want machine intelligence or not? Is it a good technology or not? A much more fruitful question, I think, is to ask, do we want this particular technology X slightly sooner or slightly later? Um, and, and then we can begin to build up some kind of micro-strategic ideas about which things we would want to accelerate relative to each other. And I think that's the sort of the space for, for realistic uh, interventions that, that we have available to us. The end. <laughs>
did all of you kind of hear it, or should I repeat? If, if somebody didn't hear it, please put up your hand. Okay, so basically, economists tend to time discount the future, whereas my reasoning seemed to assume a zero time discount rate. Um, now, it is true that uh, like economists tend to impose a time discount. Among moral philosophers, that I, I actually know, not, I can't think of a single one who thinks that from a fundamental moral point of view, there is a, a time discount rate. Like somebody's suffering doesn't matter less because it happens later in time. Just as uh, somebody's suffering doesn't matter less because it's geographically further removed from you. Uh, like if you move a suffering person to Australia, it doesn't mean that suddenly uh, their suffering doesn't matter. Right? Um, some moral philosophers do think that there are other things that matter. For example, maybe existing people matter more than people whose existence is not just preordained, and that might correlate to some extent with. But, but it doesn't result in an exponential discount. It just means that the current generation has a special weight and then everything else is kind of. So uh, there are practical reasons for uh, using time discounting as a proxy for a number of instrumental factors. So to the extent that, for example, a particular investment, that there's an alternative of just keeping the money in the bank and earning interest, and obviously you have to take that into account. Um, to the extent that the future is just cloud in more and more uncertainty, maybe you can, instead of representing that uncertainty explicitly, you just sort of think everything washes out at, at the rate of 4% a year, and that can be used as a proxy. Um, but but w once you ask the question of what fundamentally matters, then like the, 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 the great mainstream opinion among, um, in population ethics side would be that there should be no time discounting. And, and I, I, I guess I'm kind of uh, attracted to that as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds like it would be good, right? Um, the, the question is, that, there's a distinction between what ought to happen and what's actually likely to happen. There's a lot of things that oughtn't happen that are, unfortunately, have always happened, are happening, and probably will continue to happen for a while. I, I, I don't think the precautionary principle is really that helpful, uh, certainly not in this context. If you look at most of the key parameters that we might be interested in, there are existential risks on either side of that. So machine intelligence, to pick one example, can create existential risk, like machine super could be dangerous, but they could also help reduce other existential risks. And similarly for nanotechnology and, and synthetic biology and so forth. So just saying that we should like steer clear of paths where there is some risk doesn't really give us any action guiding advice, uh, because whatever we do, there will be these risks. And you rather need some way of comparing the risks and, and picking bundles of risk. Uh, it, it, I, I think part of the reason why it's um, been quite popular is that there isn't currently uh, like that much of a well-articulated alternative to the. I mean, there is like the expected utility uh, theory, like standard decision theory, but that's a too abstract a level to be applied. So you need some mid-level principle that's kind of somewhere between the universally applicable general principle and the case-specific judgment, some mid-level principle that could guide policymakers. And, and there is a kind of a gap there where I think there's more work needed to be done. I'd say in translating something like the Maxipot rule into some more tangible, concrete, ap applicable procedure.
So the question is, cooperation is, is hard. Maybe we could see what the right thing to do is, but could we get everybody to agree to do it? And so I, I, I totally agree that, that um, co co cooperation, like coordination fellows is like, like the major category of, of reason to be concerned. Uh, I, I, I think it just means that we need to keep uh, refining the question. So ultimately, it's maybe of limited interest in knowing what we should be doing, where we are humanity. More relevant to know what, say, I could be doing, or you could be doing, or, or if you're a small group of like-minded people, what your little organization could be doing, and to, to, to try to answer it all. And, and that still requires having some view about what changes would be beneficial for the world. But then you have the further question of figuring out what you can be doing that would actually make it more likely that those changes would occur in the world. With regard to combating existential risk from technology, what um, your observation implies, I think, is that th there is a penalty to propose solutions that require that everybody co collaborate. And so, for example, solutions that consist in the permanent relinquishment of some technology that, that have a lot of commercial applications and general interest might just not be very feasible. In which case, you want to instead be looking for other things you could do that might reduce the risk. So with AI risk, you know, one possible you know, solution might be we just decide never to develop AI. We, we, we decide to wait for a few hundred years until we've kind of grown up more. You know, in principle, maybe that would re really reduce the risk. But, but in practice, trying to push in that direction might achieve nothing, or it might even be counterproductive if it alienates, say, the AI research community. And instead, what you might be doing is to try to push towards accelerating, uh, say, research into the AI control problem, the AI safety problem. And that's something that doesn't require everybody in the world to agree to do it. It just requires that you know one extra talented person goes into the field, or one extra million of funding happens, and you get an incremental advance. And so it, it's very important not just to stop at asking like what would be good for the world, but also asking the further question of what, what can you do, what are you in a position to do, um, to nudge things around effectively in that direction. And, and there, of course, you have to take into account leverage, not just the sign whether something has a positive or negative effect, but also how big that is. Um, so that, that's, that's also something that we're spending significant uh, cognitive resources on, on, on pondering. Like where are the levers of influence where a small group of uh, individuals can have the largest positive effect? Yeah. You put up What I think is likely to happen is, is that it will not last for very long, that world, if, uh, that, that it will quickly transition into this world of super intelligence. And, and what the world looks like after that depends, I think, uh, partly on when we have succeeded in solving this control problem before this intelligence explosion occurs. Um, if, um, if, if, if this takeoff duration there in this diagram, if, if that's actually a longer interval, so that this world last for uh, many years or decades, or centuries even, if you're really like pessimistic about how, how long it will take to get human-level machine intelligence to reach super intelligence levels, then, then of course it becomes important to try to figure out what the world looks like in, in that interim. And um, it's possible to say something that kind of helps at least put some scenarios on the table. So, if, if you imagine as the simplest case that you had something that was exactly the same as, as, as a human mind except in a computer. So, so, so like maybe you just copy a human uh, mind into a computer and I have a human mind being a digital piece of software. So, that, so then one of the things that immediately become possible with that is to make copies of it instantaneously. The software can be instantly copyable. So now you have um, cheaply and instantly copyable human labor. <coughs> In, in, in a kind of low regulation scenario, we just expect a massive population boom of these digital minds. So you produce more and more digital workers until the, um, the, the, the wages that they could earn equals the cost of producing another digital worker. The uh, electricity bill, the hardware rental cost. So you would then bring the uh, wages down for the digital 
em emulations down to subsystems of all the digital emulations. And this is basically the Malthusian principle. And, and, and that subsistence level income for a digital mind would then be below subsistence level income for a biological human being. We, we need houses, we need food, so this is more efficient. But then at that point it would become impossible for humans to make a living to wage income. And uh, then we would have to make a living from some other source, maybe a capital gain. The economy would be uh, growing very rapidly in this transition. And, uh, High returns to capital, so, so th that that would be one hour for taxation. If if you imagine that our sort of political institutions are robust to kind of keep at bay maybe a population of trillions of upload minds that are getting ever smarter, we stop thinking biological humans. If we can keep all the political power, we may tax them. And even that might require global coordination because if there are low taxation regimes, then maybe just move the server farms there. So there are uh, kind of disturbing. Uh, implications once you start to think through what happens if, if human labor becomes uh, copyable. Um, and I, I still think though that that is a transient epoch. And at some point, even if you start out with this kind of human style digital aggregates that you will at some relatively short period of time thereafter uh, attain super intelligent, artificial intelligence. Um, and, and then I think what happens after that maybe depend more than on what these super intelligences decide to do than, than on what we do. And we, we, we have still constructed them in the first place. So if we have done our job right, they might be aligned with our values, they might be acting on our behalf. That would be the positive scenario. But if we fail in, in, in this first uh, creation uh, of, of the first kind of AI, then, 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 then that's where the existential catastrophe would be. They might use our resources for other purposes. Um, that, that keeping, just, just like if there's, if we want to park a lot, maybe there's an ant colony there, like it's not that we hate the ants, it's just that they're, like we can use their protein for other things. Um, yes. Thank you. Oh, yep. Well, I, I don't think that intelligence itself um, is sufficient for having a high level of moral value. I, I, I think there are certain types of machine intelligence that could be enormously valuable. I mean, in fact, you could imagine after super intelligence scenarios in which humans merge with machines like, like uploaded to computers, all this kind of stuff. And I think some of the really best possible outcomes would in the long term involve those. Like, I don't think like featherless bipeds forever is like the best possible result for the world. Um, however, there are also many other types of highly intelligent features that would be void of pretty much any value according to our lives, I think. So you could have a super intelligence whose only goal is to make as many paper clips as possible. And, and, and you get this bubble of, of paper clip production factories spreading through the universe and nothing else happening. And, I think that, that would be a very kind of low value future, but why not <laughs> consistent with there being great, in fact, super human level of instrumental ingenuity applied to figuring out plans to really maximize the number of paper clips. Like we are able to invent new technologies very quickly if it turns out that they will be useful for making more paper clips. And so it's not, it, it's not so much that, that Super intelligence itself either is in, it's not inconsistent with value, nor does it imply great value, but it leaves open the question of what, what there's basically like a giant container that, that just makes the world much bigger. Super intelligence or advanced technology. Then, but then the question is what it fills with. Do we have time for maybe one more question? Um, is, uh, are you trying to ask a question in the back? or? Evolution. So I don't think evolution happens uh, over multi generational timescales. And big evolutionary changes take a lot of generations. So the, 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 the only um, way in which that could happen in a kind of meaningful timescale in this context, like timescale of decades rather, rather than many centuries and millennia, is through 
this iterated demo selection, we would have multiple generations in a very short time. Um, so could super intelligence somehow you know, boost that along? What's the question? So I, I, I guess it's theoretically possible that if, if for some reason people think super intelligence is coming, in fact, it would give people more reason to favor uh, biological enhancements in humans. And you could imagine that that would quite the accelerate the development of this technology. So, like, the idea has been put forward. Sometimes, in, in other talks, I, 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 in the book, that, that you like, maybe will be on display here, um, I talk more about, like, why precisely I think superintelligence could be risky. So, like, could be big risk there. So, one, one idea that sometimes is put to me that, if, okay, well, if, if AI is, is risky, maybe that's the reason why we should, um, like, really push forward with biological enhancements. So, even if the computers get smarter and smarter, we can always keep one step ahead by making ourselves smarter as well. I think that is, is, is just um, flawed in, in as much as if we, if we um, enhance our own biological intelligence, I think that will hasten the time when we're um, overtaken by computers rather than postponed. We will then have smarter scientists, smarter computer scientists who will invent AI more quickly. <laughs> uh, th there might be other reasons why it would be a good idea to uh, ac accelerate developments of cognitive enhancements. Uh, like maybe we would want the generation that creates the first human intelligence to be as competent as possible. Um, so maybe we would rather it be done by cognitively enhanced humans, such as may exist in the second half of this century, rather than by a lot of tinkerers kind of just throwing things together and seeing what works. Um, so to the extent that that line of reasoning would actually have traction in the world, uh, yeah, I guess it is conceivable that in that in that sense, like the human evolution, in the sense of iterated embryo selection, could arrive slightly sooner if, 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 if the prospect of superintelligence motivated people to, to pursue it more. But, but that's I, it's, it's quite tenuous. I mean, I think that for the most part, these developments would be driven by considerations uh, uncoupled from beliefs about the future of AI. There are just a lot of other medical reasons or economic reasons and, and, and human welfare reasons for one might want to favor. Um, these genetic technologies and, and a lot of reasons why people might oppose them, but most of those I don't think flow through hypotheses about the future of AI. Thank you very much. <laughs>